morning again. We are going to start a new series this morning through the book of Daniel. So I'm excited. Uh, Daniel's an interesting book uh, for a lot of different reasons. It's it's kind of unique in the sense that it's it's written in different genres. It's not just a narrative like a lot of the Old Testament. The first six chapters, really, uh, they are written as a narrative. They're describing Daniel and his friends, their life in captivity in Babylon. But then chapters 7 through 12 switch to being apocalyptic. They begin to look to the future as Daniel receives visions directly from God on what will happen. And, and that's really where it kind of gets interesting because we don't, it's really hard to tell. Are the visions that Daniel received and that he recorded, are they visions about the end of our world, the end times? Or are they specifically for future events that the nation of Israel would encounter? But either way, you know, I've, I've really kind of struggled on, on where to go after the book of Ruth. And, and the Lord just kept leading me to and then back to the book of Daniel. Because I think it, it really kind of hits us where we are now. And so we've, I've titled this series that times are changing. You know, we don't, regardless of your current situation, I think, I think we can find the redemptive themes here in the book of Daniel hit us exactly where we are because we are also living in times that are changing. You know, and of course we see that vividly in the last few months. But even before the coronavirus, we live in a world that is constantly changing. If you think back 30, 40, 50, 60 years, it's a much different world than where we are today. Our culture has shifted. Our values have shifted. Our worldview in many ways has shifted. And this is, and some things are shifting even so subtly that we don't even really recognize. And so we ask the question, as I think Daniel probably had to ask the question too, is what do we do when everything around us is changing. And so obviously the Israelites in Daniel's day, they were in the middle of a massive change. It wasn't subtle. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't small. It affected every single Israelite. Then all of a sudden, God's patience and God's warning had run out, and they find themselves being conquered by Babylon. We're going to read in Daniel chapter 1, but in the year 605 B.C., 600 years before Jesus would be born, Nebuchadnezzar rolls into Jerusalem, and he completely destroys the city, and he completely destroys the temple. Now, it really shouldn't have been a surprise, because God had warned them. Even if we look as far back uh, to the life of Moses, to Deuteronomy, the last words that Moses gave to the Israelites, he said, the land that you are going into is a gift from God. If you obey, if you only worship God, if you follow his commandments, you will stay in that land. You will prosper and you will live there. But if you turn your back on God, if you follow after the gods and the idols of the people in the land that you're going in to conquer, God will remove you from that land. And then through all that time, God sent prophet after prophet warning them, look, you are walking in a dangerous path. If you don't turn from your sin, God is going to remove you from this land. But the people, they kind of grew arrogant. They're like, we are God's chosen people. Of all the people on the planet, he chose us to be his. And he's given us this land. He's not really going to kick us out of it. But they were wrong. And again, as, we, as we're going to read here in a few minutes, you know, everything in their lives was completely uprooted. And so times had changed. And now in, in the book of Daniel, they find themselves in the early days of being ruled by a foreign government. In Daniel, not every Israelite was, was in captivity. They weren't in exile. But their king had been captured, and they were all under the rule of a foreign government, and many of them were living in a foreign land. And so if you haven't already, go ahead and turn with me to Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look at the first chapter uh, as a whole this morning, and, and I want us to see three things that God gives us 
And then I want us to ask ourselves, and, and I want you to ask yourself the question of what are you doing with what God has given you? And so we're going to start off by reading just the first two verses in Daniel 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And the Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. And Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. And so again, right off the bat, we hear the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple. But we also read in this, you know, it's almost a disturbing truth that God is directly involved in the actions that are taking place. You know, unlike the book of Ruth, where we have to look diligently and search to see, God, where are you? Where are you working? Are you behind the scenes? Are you completely absent? You know, Daniel starts right off the bat by telling us that God is involved in the action. It tells us in verse 2, the Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, him that is Nebuchadnezzar. In other words, God gave, excuse me, God gave Israel into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's a hard truth to, to know that God is giving. He's actively involved in sending his chosen people, the people that he loved, the people that he's nourished for all those years. He's directly involved in and sending them into captivity. You know, it's not Nebuchadnezzar that has the power that comes in and just conquers. Yes, he was the tool that God used, but Daniel wants us to see that God is the one behind all the action. Nebuchadnezzar isn't taking King Jehoiakim. God is giving him to Nebuchadnezzar. And so that kind of leads us to the first point I want us to see this morning, and that's that God gives you over to the consequences of your sin. God gives you over to the consequences of your sin. You know, unlike in Esther, the first thing we see God doing in the book of Daniel here is that he's giving people over to the consequences of their sin. It's like, all right, if you're going to be stubborn, if you're going to follow after all these false gods, here you go. I'm not just going to give them to you, but I'm going to let you go to where they are. And they are carried away into their land. And it's not just the people that are affected, but look also at verse 2. The second half, it says, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. I mean, think about that. Not only are the people's lives uprooted, the city is destroyed, their nation is in turmoil, but also the temple, something that they waited so long to have built. The treasures of the temple of God are now being carried off, it says, into the land of Babylon to the house of his God, Nebuchadnezzar's God. And so the, the vessels, the treasures of the people of Israel, they go from being in the house of the living God to living in a house of a, of a false God. And it's you know, reading this in, in the translation that I read it, uh, I don't really, I guess I'm trying to say I agree more with the King James or the ESV or obviously you go all the way back to the Hebrew. Because my, the translation I read, it said they, they carried them to the land of Babylon. But I bet some of the versions that you're reading, uh, they say the name Shinar, the land of Shinar. And that's the word that the Hebrew um, was there in the Hebrew language. And, of course, it is the land of Babylon, so to say that they were carried to Babylon isn't false. But the Hebrew writers wanted us to know the exact place in Babylon that they were carried. But why would that make a difference? Why would the name Shinar, naming the place, why would that make such a difference? You know, and I, it kind of leads us to, the, I guess, the sub-point is that I want us to see that, that <laughs> sin always takes you backwards. And so if you look through the scriptures, where else does, does the place Shinar come up? And if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, 
Verse 2 tells us that as the people migrated from the east, they found a valley and the land of Shinar, and they settled there. And so do any of you remember what happens in Genesis chapter 11? It's a famous Sunday school lesson. Usually we skip, if we're, if we're telling stories, we go from creation, the fall, the flood, and then we skip to Genesis chapter 11. Any ideas? Yep. And so it's where these people gathered in the, in the land of Shinar. God told them to scatter over the whole earth, and they settled <laughs> here. And they get this idea that we're going to make a name for ourselves. And they start building this tower. We're going to make a tower that reaches up into the heavens. Because we want to be famous. And God looks down and he sees that they're wanting to glorify themselves instead of glorifying him. And so what did he do? He comes down and he confuses their languages. And anyone who's ever had to, had to learn another language, we look at this chapter and wish it just never happened. <laughs> Because before that, everybody on the planet spoke the same language. Because, like, all right, if you're not going to obey me, and if you're not going to glorify me, I'm going to confuse your languages so that you have to. So he confuses their languages. He gives them each different languages so that they have to scatter into their language groups to do what he said. And, of course, we, we know that as, as the Tower of Babel. We call it the Tower of Babel. Because it, it means confusion. But literally, again, the Hebrew Bible, it calls it the Tower of Babylon. Because Babylon is the word that, that most is, is closely associated with Babel. And it's this idea, it's the, the land of confusion. Uh, but again, God scatters the people at the end of chapter 11. And then we get to Genesis chapter 12. What does God do then? He comes to Abraham, right? He says, Abraham, I want you to leave your father's house, and I want you to go to a land that I'm going to show you. And so he's telling Abraham, leave Babylon. Remember, Abraham's from the Ur of the Chaldeans. He was in the land of Babylon. <clears throat> God's telling you, leave Babylon and go to a place where I'm going to show you. And, he, and he's telling us the same things. God does not want to leave us in confusion. He's telling you, I want you to leave the land of confusion and move to the land of clarity. Go to where I am showing you. But here, this wasn't the first time in Daniel 1 that, that Israel had been in Shinar. They had been in Babylon. Sin always takes you backwards. And so how many years from Genesis chapter 11... To Daniel chapter 1 has it been that they've been trying to get out of the land of confusion and then in verse 2 just so quickly they go right back there. When we read verse 2 it should make us almost want to weep that just like that God did, undid so many years. I mean think about it, they were in Egypt for 400 years. Then they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Then they finally get to the promised land, and they go through the period of the judges, and they suffer through the reign of King Saul before they got God's chosen man, the man after God's own heart. And he didn't even build a temple. It was his son Solomon who built the temple. And then after Solomon, some kings came that, that led the people to worship God, but many of them led them to, to turn away from God and led them deeper and deeper into idolatry. And so all of these years, verse 2 is just so abrupt. God gave Judah and Israel into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, and they're carried all the way back to where God wanted them out of. They go all the way back to Babylon, all the way back to the place of confusion. And so I want you to see that sin is always going to take you backwards. And, and so if there's any hope in this, you know, it's the fact that God is in control. It's, uh, and we're kind of going to skip over the second, not the second point, but the B up there. We're going to just kind of skip over that because I, I don't want it to bring any more confusion than, um, I just don't want it to bring confusion. But just think of it like this. If, if, if Judah is in God's right hand, 
And Nebuchadnezzar is in God's left hand. And God is handing Judah over to Nebuchadnezzar. Where is Judah? You know, he's still, they're still in God's hands, right? They're just in a different location. And so if there's any hope out of these first two verses, it's the fact that God is still in control. That God is still, Nebuchadnezzar is firmly in God's hands just as much as Judah is. God has control over every nation, not just the one that he created. And so if there's any hope in that, it's, it's that I just hope you see that God is still in control. But the truth is that God will give you over to the consequences of your sin. That if you're, if you're willing, we know that the penalty of death, uh, the penalty of sin is always death. We see that in the third chapter of the Bible. God clearly told Adam and Eve, if you sin, if you disobey, you will die. So apart from the, the penalty of death, uh, excuse me, the penalty of sin, which is always death, we also know that there's consequences of our sin. And, and the Israelites are feeling that right now. That yes, the penalty that they deserve is death. But they're suffering through the consequences of their sin of having to be removed from the promised land going all the way back to where they started, and they're in the same place they were hundreds of years before, in a land of confusion. They don't know the culture. They don't know the language. They don't know the customs. They don't even, they're just, they're completely out of sorts. And so that's, it's just, we should read verse 1 and 2 and just, like, God, how can you do this? But thankfully the story, the story doesn't end there. And so I want us to, to read verses 3 through 10 next to see our next point. So it says, The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and literature, and the king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time they were to attend the king. And among them from the Judahites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name Belchizar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. And God granted Daniel kindness and compassion from the chief eunuch. Yet he said to Daniel, I fear the Lord, I fear the my Lord the king, who assigned your food and drink. What if he sees your faces looking thinner than the other young men your age, and you would endanger my life with the king? And so again, this is a familiar story that if Daniel um, <coughs> let me get the names right. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We know them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But their real name, their, their Jewish name, was Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so there they find themselves in Babylon, and they're going through this crash course. You know, they've, they've got new leaders. They get their syllabus. All right, for the next three years, we're going to try to get you to forget everything that you know, and we're going to teach you what we want you to know. We're going to teach you our language, teach you our culture. But you don't even have to worry about anything because we're going to give you food. You get to eat the same food and drink the same wine that the king drinks. But Daniel says, I'm not going to defile myself. You know, he was resolved. He was determined not to defile himself with the king's food. And so he goes and he asks permission. Can, I, can you just give us water and vegetables to drink? I don't want to eat the king's food. But then his overseer is like, well, you know, I, if something bad happens to you, if you look sickly, if you look different than everybody else, the king's not going to get mad at you, but he's going to take it out on me. 
And so this, this overseer is concerned for his own well-being. He's like, if I let you slack off and, and get weak, you know, the king's not going to get mad at you. He's going to get mad at me. But I want us to see the next point uh, tonight, today, and we're, we're going to look at this section more in-depthly next week. So I don't want you to think we're just kind of breezing through. Uh, but today I want us to kind of focus on verse 9. He said, so Daniel asked if, if he could have permission, basically, to not defile himself with the king's food. And verse 9 tells us, even before the eunuch speaks, it says, God had granted Daniel kindness and gave compassion. Excuse me. God had granted Daniel kindness and compassion. And so I want us to see the next point is that even in captivity... God gives you kindness and compassion. Like he is not bound by captivity. Even in captivity, God can continue to, to love you, to take care of you. And so, yes, they've been taken out of the promised land, but God had not left them completely alone. And this word kindness here, it's the same word for kindness that we studied in the book of Ruth. It means the loving kindness of God. So we see that God's kindness is not based, and I think it says favor. Yep. Um, that's what I get for going back and forth between English and, and different languages. Uh, but I really like the word kindness instead of favor. So you don't have you can write favor uh, or you can put kindness. Uh, but it's this idea of loving kindness of God. It's not based on your own merit. It's not based on what you have done. Remember, there uh, and not so much Daniel. Uh, again, we, God gives us over to the consequence of our sin. But when we think about Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they were young. Maybe as young as 13 or 14. And so they're suffering the consequences of their father's sins and their grandfather's and great-grandfather's sins. Now, they weren't perfect. They were still sinners, and they had made mistakes. But it's... it's we see this in our world today. There are, there are things that happen in our world that we can't control, but we still have to suffer through. We talked about that with Ruth, that some things we have happen in life simply because we live in a fallen world. And so that's the case of Daniel and his friends here. But even still, even though they are suffering through the consequences of their grandfather's and great-grandfather's disobedience, and they're suffering in a fallen world that God continues to give compassion. It's not based on their own merit, but it's based on God's character. And so we see that God was on the throne before they went into captivity, and God is still on the th throne while he is in, while they are in captivity. And the same gives us hope today, that as we live in the midst of a changing culture and a changing world, God was on the throne before your world started to change, and he is still on the throne in the middle of changing times. And so even in the land of confusion, God is able to give his people kindness and compassion. And so he doesn't leave you alone. We also see that God's compassion isn't based on your current situation. I already talked about this, but it's the fact that they're in captivity. But the fact of being in captivity does not stop God from, from giving us his compassion. And so no matter what situation you find yourself in, God still wants to pour out his love and his kindness and his compassion on you. And so let's read the rest of this chapter. We're going to pick up in verse 11. It says, so Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief eunuch had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink, and then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who were eating the king's food, and deal with your servants based on what you see. And so he agreed with them about this and tested them for ten days. And at the end of ten days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. And so the, so the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. 
And God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. And at the end of the time that the king had said to present them, the chief eunuch presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. And the king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they began to attend the king. And every matter of wisdom and understanding that the king consulted them about, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the mediums in his entire kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the until the year of King Cyrus. So again, Daniel asked, just let us, you know, I'm not going to defile myself. And God gives him, because of his faithfulness, God pours out his kindness and his compassion on Daniel and his three friends. And then Daniel comes up with this idea, well, just test us for ten days. Just give us ten days. That's not going to hurt. That's not going to bankrupt a three-year program. Just try it for 10 days. Let us drink water and eat vegetables for 10 days, and if we look sickly and weak and unhealthy, then we'll go back and we'll eat the food that you give us. But just try it out for 10 days. And so this, uh, this overseer that's, that's over him, he agrees. That's what happens. And then what happens after the 10-day period? Now, they're the ones that end up looking better. They look healthier. They look uh, more well-nourished than everyone else. And so they continue to be able to not defile themselves and continue to eat the food that they would, they would prefer to eat. They're drinking vegetables and drinking water. And the next point I want us to see comes in verse 17. It's that God gives you the skills that you need. Look at verse 17. It says, God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. So God is going to give you what you need. He's going to prepare you. He's going to give you the skills that you need. And so if we look back in verse 14, it was, uh, we've already seen God's compassion and his kindness. And now God is giving Daniel and his friends favor with others. Look at verse 14. He is talking about the overseer. He agreed with them about this and tested them for 10 days. And so of the skills that God gives you, one of the things he gives you is he gives you favor in the sight of others. And God also gives you, if we, if we go back to verse 17, that God gives you gifts and skills as he alone sees fit. If we look at all of 17, it says, God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. And the, ne <clears throat> the next sentence says, Daniel also understood visions and dreams of every kind. And so all four of them receive understanding in the literature. They all receive wisdom but only Daniel receives the ability to understand dreams and visions. And so through that, we see that God gives us gifts as he freely sees fit. You know, and it's not a competition. I don't want you to think that, well, I don't have this spiritual gift, or I don't have this, uh, <clears throat> this ability, and you start comparing yourself with one another. Because God looks down from heaven, and he sees you exactly as you are, and he gives you the gifts that he wants you to have. He knows exactly what you need to serve him. And it's not a competition. It doesn't matter. The other three friends, they weren't upset. No, nowhere in here does it tell us that they were mad at God because they couldn't understand dreams and visions. And so God gives you the gifts that he wants you to have. And so God's gifts, he gives you favor with others. He gives you the gifts that he wants you to have as he sees fit. And then if we keep going in the story, <clears throat> verse 19 tells us, The king interviewed them, and among all of them, no one was found equal to Daniel, Hananiah, 
Mishael, and Azariah. So they began to attend the king. God's gifts also make you stand out. You know, of all the people in the kingdom, these four Israelites, God has given them his gifts, and they are standing out. And so we should be asking ourselves, does your relationship with Jesus, does it make you stand out? Do people realize that you have been with Jesus? Does your quiet time and your Bible study, does it change you? Does it impact you in a way where people notice a difference? When God gives you his favor and his compassion and his kindness, and he gives you the gifts that he wants you to have, it should make you stand out. Later on, it tells us that they were ten times better than everyone else in the entire kingdom. Which is interesting because they only tested him for ten days. And in ten days, God's favor and compassion, by the end of their time, they were ten times better in the king's eyes than anyone else. And so God's gifts should make us stand out. And so even, especially in times that are changing, in, in times that are trying, you know, we as Christians, we should stand out even more because we're not swayed and we shouldn't be swallowed up by all the disaster and the chaos that is around us. Because even though times are difficult, we know whose hands we're in and we are still in God's hands. We're not in the hands of a virus. We're not in the hands of any one king or ruler. We are in the very hands of God and that should give you confidence to stand out even more even more, to know that God is still in control. And then lastly, we see in verse 21, it says, Daniel remained there, that is in, in Babylon, until the first year of King Cyrus. And so God's gifts prepare you for a lifetime of service. You know, we talked about how they went into captivity. Daniel went into captivity in the year 605 B.C. Then in verse 21, he was there until the first year of King Cyrus. And as best we can tell, that was in the year 539 B.C. So if you do the math, that's 66 years. Daniel was in Babylon serving the king, but ultimately serving God for 66 years. You know, God's gifts, are they for today? Absolutely, but they're not just for today. Are they for tomorrow? Yes, they are for tomorrow, but they extend beyond tomorrow. God's gifts for you, they prepare you for a lifetime of service and ministry. And we talked about, the, the, joked about the age of when a Christian, you know, ends his service in Sunday school. You know, and so if, uh, if we're going by this, you've got at least 66 years of ministry. Um, and so, but... We want to come back to the question we started with, that what are you doing with what God has given you? You know, are you letting the, the, the changing times drown out your relationship with God? You know, have you, have you put your relationship with him and your time with him on the back burner? Because there's so many other things that are more pressing, that are more uh, important in your eyes. You know, again, we should think back to verse 2 and, and be reminded of this terrifying reminder that God will give you over to the consequences of your sin. Even if Jesus has paid the penalty for your sin, even if you are saved, we can still suffer through the consequences of our sins. And verse 2 is a terrible reminder of what happens when we try to live life on your own. You know, sin has consequences. And it's always going to take you backwards. And it's always going to take you to a place that you don't want to go. But the truth is also there that God is with you. He's giving you his compassion. He's giving you his kindness. And he's given you gifts that he specifically wanted you to have. So that you can serve him for your entire life. And his gifts should make Jesus stand out even more in your everyday life. And so as we close, you know, maybe you're maybe you're thinking, you know, you know, how can I use what God has given me for his glory? You know, do I really stand out on a daily basis? Do people truly know 
when I'm going in the grocery store, when I'm talking with my neighbors, when I'm playing with my grandchildren, do, do people really notice that I have been with Jesus? And I think that's a relevant question. Do you stand out? But also, maybe you're here, maybe you're listening or, or watching online, and you're wondering, you know, with all the chaos that's going on in the world, does God really care about me? Yeah, I know what the words in the book say, but does God really care? Does he really love me? And yes, absolutely yes, God loves you. Absolutely, he cares about you. He has given you his own son, Jesus, to make sure that you do not fall into captivity. You know, as we think about the story of Daniel and his three friends and how they were taken into captivity, but they continued to serve God in a foreign place. You know, they're just a small part of a much bigger story. That one day Judah would be rescued from captivity. And someone through their line, another young man would come along. And he would be in a temple and he would be teaching. And his teaching would stand out. That God gave Jesus the gift of standing out. That even when he was at a young age, people could not understand how much knowledge and understanding he had when he taught. And so of all the gifts that God has given us, Jesus is the greatest gift. Daniel and his three friends, they were faithful. As we're going to read on, they were faithful even to the point of death, as we're going to see in the next few weeks. But their death did not save me and you. But Jesus was faithful to the point of death, and his death and his resurrection, it changed the course of history. That Daniel could not free his people from captivity. But Jesus not only freed the tribe of Judah and the nation of Israel from Babylonian captivity, but he frees you from the captivity of your sin and the death, the penalty that it deserves. And so there is nothing that Jesus cannot do, but you have to ask yourself the question, yes, Jesus loves you, and know that Jesus loves you, but to ask yourself the question, have you truly given your life to him? And so let me pray for us this morning. So Father God, we do thank you for just the story of Daniel that shows how you are in control of everything, God, that, uh, that yes, there is a punishment for sin, yes, there are consequences for our sins, but Jesus, you love us so much that you paid the consequences for us, and that even when we are in a fallen world, even when we are in, in days that we don't understand and we don't know what's going to happen next, we can look back and see that we are still in your hands. And that you are still giving us your kindness and your compassion and equipping us with everything that we need to serve you. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that you would do what only it can do in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so as we get ready to sing <clears throat> this morning, uh, I just want you to know that the altar is always open. You know, if there's, if there's a sin that the Lord has convicted you about, you are free to come and, and kneel and confess that and pray. You know, if you want to talk with me about, about how you can use the gifts that, that God has given you in a more full way, know that I am always here and available. And if you've never received the greatest gift of God, God's eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, I would love to tell you how you can do that. And if you're watching online and, and you would like to, to respond or you feel that you need to respond in some way, you can go to our website. It's salembaptist.weebly. It's W-E-E-B-L-Y dot com. And there's a tab called Receiving God's Salvation. And if you'll simply just leave your first name and your email address, someone from our church will be in contact with you to see how we can support you and love you. And so I just want you to know the altar is open, and I pray that you will respond as the Lord leads.